Okay, we're back live here in San Francisco, California, Oracle Open World 2012. This is SiliconAngle.com, theCUBE. Our flagship program, we go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and we're here with Vu Nguyen, who is an infrastructure engineer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Labs, a NetApp customer. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, we're here at Oracle Open World, and uh, what do, you th what do you think of the vibe here? Uh, it's uh, interesting, fun, you know, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Glad, glad to be a part of it. What brings you to Open World? Uh, Network Appliance has asked me to uh, come and uh, speak about uh, the uh, Mars uh, Science Laboratory, which a lot of people know as uh, Curiosity, and the recent right. events related with Curiosity. Right. The Curiosity Project. So, so tell us about the. Tell us about the, the, the Mars initiative. That's sort of, a lot of people are interested in that. You know, there was a period of time where it was sort of the, the world questioned whether or not we should be exploring Mars and then sort of NASA went in that direction. Give us a little history of that program to the extent that you can. Um, the, uh, the whole idea behind Mars is actually we're trying to understand Mars better uh, in terms of its geology. And uh, the more we know about Mars' geology, it actually helps us to understand better our own Earth's geology. And so the concept here is actually the more we learn about uh, the geology on Mars, we might actually ex understand how and why uh, Mars might have lost a, a lot of its atmosphere, lost water, and things of that nature, and how it might actually come back and uh, assist us in understanding our world better. Now, so uh, we were talking off camera, and I had made the comment that probably not a lot changes, and you've been with the Mars Project for 10 years, right? Yes. Uh, starting in uh, 2002. And I had made the comment, not a lot probably changes on Mars in 10 years. So that's not the case. No, it changes. It, in, it in changes, and actually it changes quite often. And in a lot of cases, it changes in a surprising way that we hadn't uh, anticipated. Uh, in particular, is actually uh, just over a period of, uh, I believe it was, um, Within a year, I, I'm not quite sure in terms of the amount of months, but uh, we experienced a case where the MRO uh, orbiter flew over a, uh, a you know, basically a, uh, a mountainous region, and uh, you know, the, the initial images showed that there was nothing there. It was just like you know, just barren, uh, you know, a, a side of a mountain. But on the second pass, we saw what appears to be like some kind of a liquid flow. And so, you know, so that in itself is very exciting because we hadn't anticipated that. And we're not sure whether it's water, either liquid carbon dioxide, or a, some other kind of liquid, but obviously there's some form of liquid coming out. So that in itself shows that, you know, there's a lot of change that's happening on a planet that we had thought that it's fairly lifeless or fairly static. Well, I got to ask you because obviously we're here at Oracle Open Worlds about databases and you know all that tech boring stuff, you know, compared to what you work on. <laughs> right. And okay. um, just you know, uh, two weeks ago I had a, had a chance to watch the space shuttle Endeavor fly over uh, you know, Silicon Valley, and people had that moment of like, wow, you know, it's like an end of an era, you know, right. from going back from the from the early, you know the '60s to, to today. But a whole nother level of science is taking place that you're part of. Share with the folks two things. One is, what's the feeling within the science community that you're involved in around the, that end of that chapter of, of Endeavor? And then two, what new things you're exploring uh, in science and in space in particular that's truly uh, exciting, share with them, get people excited about it. Because a lot of people, this is not a niche market. People were really emotionally moved by that shuttle experience. And there's a lot of science and math and geeks out there who love space, ships, and science. So, one, take us through the emotion of that event, and then what's the new frontier like now? Um, in, the, in the case of the uh, you know, Discovery and in, the shuttle in general, um, even though uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, we don't have direct uh, link or you know, work related with the shuttle, but uh, we ourselves feel quite saddened that you know, you're right, it is an end of an era. And uh, you know we see uh, new efforts going into getting more manned missions on you know more uh, humans into space. But again, it's 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 sad. It's it's like seeing a a sibling kind of going away on a college trip or you know going to school that we're not going to be able to see them again and things like that. We're not quite see them for a while, home. retirement home <laughs> or something like that. Yes. <laughs> but but so yeah, we we are we are quite 
you know, saddened by it. Um, you know, we, we, we felt that, yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was a hard program and, and it, it was definitely, you know, appreciated and needed. So and with that, what's the new stuff that's happening? Because with the project that you're involved in is exploring the science side of things, and, I'm, and we'll get into the big data conversation in a second, but what's the, the new exciting things? A lot of people are now, after that event, are, are trying to understand where the action is, where the excitement is. To, to kind of uh, simplify it a bit, um, you know, going back to the, uh, the MER project, which is uh, most people are familiar with, is the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. Um, if you think about it, that mission launched in uh, 2003, around June time. Uh, there were two spacecrafts, but you know, uh, if you look at the technology that's associated with those spacecraft compared to the technology associated with Curiosity, um, just the something as simple as the images that come from those two spacecraft. Um, now, I mean, mind you, again, I'm oversimplifying this. So, yeah, yeah, you know, okay. uh, we're so not rocket it, scientists, so you can do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so it, 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 you can kind of view it as taking a, uh, uh, you know, something like a, a VHS image and looking at it, and then all of a sudden you're bringing together a Blu-ray and you're looking at that resolution there, and you go like, oh my, you know, we can actually see the tiny little specks of dust and sand and dirt on rocks, on surfaces, as opposed to before we had to actually get closer to actually see it. So, so that in itself is a, is a testimony to much more data. So you know, we encounter much more data coming down, and also the, the difference in terms of technology, uh, you know, where we're actually having to do with larger data and also being able to examine and, 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 uh, and analyze images and things like that, you know, in the, in the yeah. case of science. I was talking with a high school student um, just a couple weeks ago and I said, you know, what are you interested in, in career-wise? He's like, I love space and science. I go, you know, what do you think that will turn into? And he said, this is just, you know, com complete naivety. I think the answer to our energy problem is somewhere in space. Just the kind of just that unconsciously competent kind of vision. And it's a little bit out there, I mean, it's a stretch to say that, but share with us, given that kind of future leader that might someday be part of the, of the science community, um, that's some of the things in, in science. What is going to come in and, and discover? What's the discoveries that are out there that you see and that's being talked about in the science? And you can oversimplify it, but just in a vision standpoint, right. what are the new breakthroughs that are coming out of the data? Um, I, I really can't talk much about the data because I'm not too involved on the science teams itself. Uh, on my side of it, I'm on the team that basically performs real-time operations. So in a lot of our cases, we, we, uh, we get the data to come down and we process the data into what we call data products and then we pass it on to the science teams. So that in itself expands you know, multiple times up and above so it gets really big. Uh, in terms of science, I really can't say much because I'm not on the team. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, just the sheer storage and the data sizes that are coming down, expansion rates and things like that, it, it definitely pushes our limits in terms of uh, the amount of uh, storage and data that we have to store. And um, so we always have to reevaluate uh, you know, what kind of infrastructure we have in order to accommodate more and more data coming down because we never remove anything. We hold on to every piece of data because we never know when we might come upon a particular uh, you know, uh, day's worth of work on Mars where we didn't realize we discovered something until we, the scientists and all their folks come back and evaluate the information. And they come back and they go, hey, we found something interesting, let's go back and take a look at it. And if it's a major event, it actually might explode up and above that. So, you know, so the data, access to the data is key, you're going to need search. So you need to have some sort of data, data store that's has a low latency. Talk about some of the challenges there and what, what the new tech you're using. Um, especially in the down lake, we're expected to process the information at real time. So we are required to uh, expand data products at a certain rate. And uh, um, the scientists and uh, other teams expect that data to come in so they can actually perform their level of analysis and also planning for the next day's worth of missions. Or you know uh, where to go, where to drive, what rock to look at, what kind of geology we're going to do, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically chemical analysis and things like that. So, so, so the data comes down, you process it in real time, essentially, and then it gets archived? It Is gets, right? yeah, it gets archived. 
uh, or it gets stored, let's say it that way. It okay. gets stored and then it also, that storage in itself, the other teams can actually pick up that data and actually continue on with the processing. Okay, Yeah. and so it's never really archived, it's, Eventually, it's sort of, yeah. it's, it's perpetually archived, yeah. I guess. It, it, yes. it's, it, it, will, it will go off to, it will eventually be archived, okay. but it, it goes into uh, more like a, a storage state than it is an archive. So, so we store it, and then as it gets you know, older and older, it'll probably get into an archive state, but even the archive state, uh, the project wants the data to be always online and readily available. So it's an so active archive. It's an act, yes. So you've got essentially archive. three tiers, right? You've got the yeah. processing tier, the storage layer, which is the sort of Yeah, and then somewhat the archive tier, the yes. Kind of the archive. Yeah. And which is the most storage intensive? Can you talk about those? It's the it's the processing. It is, okay. Yeah, the processing well, is most why intense. Why is that? Can you describe sort of the type of data that you're ingesting and how uh, you're handling that? We, uh, it, it's the type of data is actually telemetry coming down. Mm -hmm. And uh, the telemetry has uh, in it broken into uh, basically what we call uh, channelized telemetry. And that breaks out, we actually process that. We break the channels out because each channel serves for a purpose. Some of it's science data, some of it is engineering data, meaning like spacecraft health and things like mm -hmm. that. And um, so it just depends on where it goes. But that information has to be processed in near real time so that you know the scientists and the other teams can get at their data. So you're getting a raw processing. data stream. We're getting a raw data stream, Okay, and yes. then so you have to put that into some kind of format that's consumable by the scientists. Right, yeah, the format that comes down is, out, Compression is not the right way to really say it, but it's a form of like compression, and so we have to expand on it and you know and process it and prepare it. And can you talk about like how much data you manage? Um, I mean, so is it objects that you're managing? Um, I'll give you one, you know, a couple of cases. Uh, we're just starting to do a lot of the science, so so Curiosity is very new, so it's very fresh. So we don't have really uh, we have a, an estimate of how much data might be coming down, but so far. We're getting something in the neighborhood of, uh, I believe it was 128 megabytes uh, per day. And that in itself is expanded on at least at least 30 times. And then that's just from the initial uh, ground data system doing that expansion. Um, up and above that, the science team will actually probably process that further and I, I'm not sure what the expansion rate on that would be. Okay, a and so, Talk about your storage infrastructure, if you would. What, what does it look like, and how has it changed over the last 10 years? Um, we've gone through uh, numerous vendors, uh, but we ultimately, you know, we have a requirement for the infrastructure to be fairly robust. It has to survive, uh, you know, minimal downtime is required. We do have window of, of opportunity where, uh, you know, maintenance can be done, but it's far and few in between. So, um, and, and scientists and uh, engineers expect the data to be available at all times. Because, you know, you don't know when they might, like again, come back and reevaluate the information that they have already. So what's the infrastructure look like? You got, you know, a set of servers, you got- We have a set of servers. We have using direct attack. No, we use uh, NAS file, servers. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we have a lot of NAS servers. Okay. And uh, we also have uh, SanAttach for our databases and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So you're storing files? You're st yeah, we basically, uh, the databases is a uh, method we use for searching. Uh, it has contains metadata, and uh, the, the storage is actually just on, you know, files are just stored on, on NAS storage. Is object storage something that you've looked at? Uh, no, we have not looked at that. No? No. It's just, I think it's too early for that? Um, um, at this point, not really uh, I'm case. not sure. Yeah. But you know, it, it's something that uh, we will evaluate at, with the future missions that are coming on board. So big right. data um, is a big part of it. Obviously, you guys got to collect data um, and then get to access to the data really fast. So a lot of batch storage using Hadoop. Are you guys using what kind of technologies are you guys using on the uh, store, the bit back end? The back end, uh, we have a lot of uh, network appliance uh, to, to handle that storage. So you're building schemas out when you store all the data? Um, I'm not. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we get. We're almost. Out, we're out of time. Getting the hook there. We're trying to drill and find out what he's got in there. In NASA. They got to keep their. Got to keep their secrets. Uh, top secret. So almost had a, an answer there, Dave. But uh, we'll be right back with our next guest here inside the Cube Jet Propulsion Lab. Doing some great work. Obviously, storing data from space for discovery is a big deal. And uh, thanks for coming inside the Cube. Appreciate thanks, it. Man. We'll be right okay. back.